latch lessons from the latch manual. And we're very excited that you're all with us today. And again, today's webinar is brought to you by State Farm and Safe Kids. So as always, we always have our objectives for our webinars. Today, you're gonna to learn the latest about latch and related topics. Learn how to find that info in the latch manual. Learn what's new in the 2021 edition and also learn general tips about the latch manual and other resources that make CPS work more accurate, efficient, and easy. So we are very excited to have on the call with us today, Denise Donaldson. Many of you know Denise. She is the owner and editor of Safe Ride News Publications, which include the Safe Ride News newsletter, the latch manual, and the school bus safety handbook. Denise also runs a CPS program through Seattle Area Hospitals, which she founded in 1996, and she has been a CPST instructor since 1998. We also want to just note that Denise currently serves on the U.S. National CPS Board, but she is not representing the board during this presentation today. So we are very excited to have you on the call with us today, Denise, and with that, I will hand it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Stephanie. You can hear me okay? We sure can. Great. Okay. Hi, friends. Uh, thanks for joining me for this webinar about Latch. Uh, in the past, I've done sessions that cover certain hot topics or that focus on certain sections of the manual. But every time we release a new edition, I'm asked to do a session that just covers everything that's new since the last edition. And I always decline that approach because there's just no way I could cover every aspect that's changed. There's really just too much. However, this year I thought it would be fun to kind of compromise and do a smattering of new information and also show how things in the manual do change. So while this is definitely not all that's new, it should give you a good sense of the types of things that change and that have changed. But naturally, it's not just about this book, of course, per se, but about learning about the proper use of car seats to keep kids safe. And so we'll be just be using the latch manual as a way to learn about the latest in latch. Uh, and if you've uh, heard me present before in the past, you've definitely seen this slide before, because while we'll be focusing a lot on the latch manual today, Naturally, it's important to remember that this resource is just one of many. Most importantly, always check the car seat and vehicle instructions, as well as labels and supplemental resources like FAQs and videos on manufacturers' uh, websites. The latch manual fits in with all of these because it includes information directly from the manufacturers that can add to, clarify, or confirm information that you can get from these other sources. And importantly, it's written in a uh, for a CPST audience. So that means it's going to be in our language. It's going to address topics that can be more detailed than what we would see in owner's manuals or it would even be appropriate for being in owner's manuals. And in many cases, knowing the reader is a trained professional allows the manufacturers and, and me too as editor to cover topics that are important, but that may maybe would be too much or too confusing for the general public. So it can go into more depth. One point I want to get across in this presentation is that because the field is always evolving, you really do need to use the most current manual, which, get, which gets updated every two years. And of course, right now we're in the 2021 edition, you see there, uh, it being green, we're enjoying calling it greeny this time. And so yes, with each new edition, we do add new car seats and new vehicles. But because older vehicles don't really ever expire, we don't remove those old vehicles. So in other words, you don't need to worry um, about having these older manuals in your kit in order to work with older vehicles because that information will still be there for you. Um, and you really wouldn't want to work with these older ones because with each new edition, we ask the manufacturers to re-review all the older material, including product specifics as well as their overall policies. And, and so changes to past information really does happen. Um, sometimes the manufacturer wants to add or change their past information, but other times uh, we're, we're suggesting updates. And, and a lot of times it's stuff we hear from you all in the field, so thanks for that. But the bottom line is using an outdate manual kind of risks you know, helping people with outdated information. So you really wanna use what's current. 
So yeah, this is my rainbow of older manuals that I do keep, but I kind of justify keeping them because I use them for historical research purposes. And yeah, I have a weakness for nostalgia. So I would probably keep them anyway, but no way would I use those older ones to help the public or help caregivers. You know, honestly, these older books for most people could really just be recycled. Now let's start learning by meandering through the latch manual. And as a reminder, the basic layout starts with a glossary, which I'm gonna actually talk a bit more about today. And then we have eight chapters that teach all about latch and the proper use of latch. And that's followed by Appendix A with information from car seat manufacturers, Appendix B with information from vehicle manufacturers, and Appendix C that focus on, focuses on latch use in center positions. A couple, couple things to note here before I move on. Um, one, if you've used the latch manual for a while, you've seen it evolve over the years. We've added and removed chapters and even appendices at times. And for a while, the information really moved around every two years. But a couple of editions ago, I felt like we'd landed on a really solid layout. And so I made a conscious decision to keep the layout the same. So while the words are being updated, of course, you know, with the information being refreshed and, and added to, I do try hard to keep the layout the same so that all the work we're doing as a field to learn how to find things efficiently in this book, don't, they don't need to be relearned every two years. Because let's face it, this is a big book and just having it handed to you, it is not going to be useful to anyone until they learn the layout. And so what I don't want to do is switch that up on you every couple of years. So the other thing to note here are these photos, which is just trying to show you that you can fan the book to see the tabs for each of the chapters, and then a page long band to delineate each of the appendices. So that can be helpful to you for finding things quickly. As I mentioned, I wanna take a moment to note that there is a glossary uh, at the beginning of the book. The manual is written in CPS speak. So hopefully it's written in a way that's pretty clear to CPSTs, but if there are any terms you're not sure about, just know you can check the glossary for clarifications. And naturally I'm gonna review each edition and make changes and additions to the glossary as we go along. But for today's presentation, I thought I would focus on just one, one topic that got added a bit a, a little while ago, which was the topic of the support leg. And so this is an example of um, a terminology that, that is, is kind of coming in new for our field. You're hearing a lot more about it lately, I'm sure. And just as a reminder, this image shows you what an example of what one is and the glossary is going to define it as a post-like feature that extends from a few car seats to the floor to help stabilize the car seat and limit rotation and rebound in a crash. So you might be thinking, okay, that's great. What's that got to do with latch? And, and that's a very good point because for by and large for this manual, I have to be pretty careful because it could grow really, really big if I put a lot of things in here that weren't re latch related. But what ended up happening was I did have a manufacturer come to us a couple editions ago and ask to add some information to the latch manual for CPSTs that wasn't in all of the older manuals for the vehicle, for their for the brand's vehicle. And so if a manufacturer asks us to specifically put something in their entries in Appendix B for uh, talking to us as technicians, I'm certainly happy to oblige with that. And so this manufacturer calls uh, this feature a support leg. And so that's how it ended up in the glossary. But I want to point out this last sentence notes, a support leg is the same thing as a stability leg, a load leg, a foot prop. You might see it written in, this, in those ways in various manuals. Uh, but, but just know that that's all going to be the same as a support leg uh, in this glossary. And so it, it, this is an example of something that you can find additional information in the latch manual about that uh, as now we have at least six brands are offering car seats with uh, legs on them. It's, it's good to have the supporting information. And so, for example, this first one that came to us was Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, which is the parent company of Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram. And they have some vehicles in their line, not every one of them, but some of their models, they do not want you to use the load leg or the support leg with those vehicles. So here we have a Chrysler Pacifica van for these specific model years. And it says in the notes, 
child restraints with a support leg do not use the child restraints support leg in this vehicle keep it stowed and then it refers you back to the glossary if you need a reminder of what that means and so um, it's not really saying why they're saying that but you can find which of the models in which of the model years that they would say don't use it and, and in some cases possibly what positions but that is something you can find in the latch manual and some people have also heard this from the from the fiat chrysler group uh, generally and learned that the reason for that had to do with a concern whether they'd done testing or they just weren't sure i don't know which frankly but the reason has to do with these captain's chairs that have a storage location under the floor that means there's going to be a void space with a lid that covers up when the seat's up in use so if the if the car seat were on that seat and there's a kind of hollow space under the floor the way that the 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 support leg works is that in a crash it's going to load the floor through this leg and they were worried or certain that either that that uh, wasn't something that they wanted to have happen in those particular vehicles and so that's where that information got put in now over time technicians uh, heard that that was the rationale and and you know t technicians are awesome they're always thinking and they're saying hey i know of some other cars that have those kinds of features where there's a hollow space and maybe we should apply the same warning to those vehicles as well so we started to hear that it was a lot of that was being talked about online for instance and so for this last for the 2021 when we put out the information we prepare a questionnaire for their policies every time for them to either reinstate them or add to them and if we have new topics we introduce them in that way and so we added a topic asking all of the manufacturers hey you know some some people have said they have a problem with the support leg also known as a load leg or stability leg on the floor of the vehicle do you have any models in which you want to give that us that information as well and so i just wanted to point out that that question was asked and we did not get any replies back that said there was any concern so while i can't promise you that that is a hundred percent certain that there is no other model that other brands that have this concern i i can tell you that we asked the question and no one replied to us that there was any problem now that is specifically um a lot of people were concerned because the honda odyssey van is such a popular family vehicle and you may know that the set between the the second row and the first row there's an underfloor storage for the spare tire in that particular vehicle so that means that's a, a lid under there where if the leg was on it that could possibly be a problem so people were worried about what if that should be applied to a honda odyssey and so when we asked uh the question to all the manufacturers we were pleased to see that honda actually uh, addressed the specific concern with the odyssey and came back to us with an affirmative that it is okay to use the leg in the honda odyssey second row uh, and we were actually allowed to put a statement in their entry that says despite the presence of underfloor storage or for the spare tire, the leg use is permitted in all seating positions. So that's what we wanna see is that affirmative, yes, it's okay to do. And this is also kind of a good example of why not to take what one manufacturer says is okay or required in their product and blanketly apply it without checking with other manufacturers. So uh, that is a good place to find that written permission to do so in that part, in that car. Um, and so um, I just want to point out again, this is Appendix B, you're flipping through finding the exact models and this information is found in this notes section here. Now, when it comes to the other one of the FCA brands, Ram trucks, those trucks have across the board uh, an area on the floor um, where you can lift a lid and there's storage like you throw your tools in under the floor. And so in because there were uh, there would be that same note for every single model that made us want to move that uh, information up as a bullet under the RAM brand because it really applies to pretty much all the models. Here it says in the bullets, which is you can see this is the first page of RAM. It's just that section that has all the little bulleted information that applies to all the all the brand, all the vehicles in the brand. and. It says, unless a model note says that it's okay to use it, don't use it. 
So um, it, under RAM, they do have a ProMaster van where it's okay, they don't have storage. And so that note appears for ProMaster, but for all the rest of the trucks, you would say you would not use the leg. And so this information is also uh, found uh, to assist you a little bit in the Appendix A information as well for the car seat manufacturer information. So here's an example for Cybex, which has a load slash support leg. We call it here because I think they call it a load leg in their manual uh, for the Serona S. And so you see this is if you were in the if you're in the um, a little touchy, sorry. If you were in the Appendix A entry for Cybex and you go through the to the convertible car seat section. Under the description for these models, it's going to tell you that there's a load or support leg. Uh, here we have for CLEC, the CLEC Ling also has one. And so rather than put it here with the description, however, I put it here under the design and use because in this case, in the case of the Ling, whether or not you're using the load leg actually does influence whether you should, they want you to install using a seat belt versus the lower anchor connectors. So that's actually part of the actual usage information. So another thing that's interesting to notice here too is that while we're getting a little bit used to seeing these legs on some car seats, it's typically like this on a base and it's sticking out, but do take note that the Serona S is a convertible car seat. Uh, that has a swiveling seating area. So that leg is actually on a convertible car seat and it is useful in both forward and rear facing positions. So this is an energy management system that is technically uh, a factor that a feature that could appear on any rear or forward facing seat. We're seeing it mostly on these rear facings, but just be aware that it could be utilized in other uh, types of seats as well. And we're already starting to see it here in, in at least this one example. Alrighty, so that is the main thing I wanted to talk about on the load legs just because it's become such a popular topic. Uh, moving along to the chapter updates that we make, remember we have eight chapters and those chapters are written by me for the most part just by information that summarizes what we know about latch and historically and about lower anchors, about tethers. Um, although there are a couple chapters I'll mention in a moment that are going to have manufacturer specific information included. But generally speaking, I want to give a flavor of why we make updates to these chapters and why you'd want to look in here. And so for the examples, I just turned to chapter three and came up with some examples from that chapter. It could have been any other place, but this is just a, a smattering of what you might see. And for starters, you know, I try my best, but every time I reread it, every two years, I figure out ways that I can say things a little clearer, better wording. And so I'm always going to be editing that way, of course. But there's also going to be things that just really the passage of time means that we need to change how it's worded. And so this example that I'm showing here from chapter three is page 20. This is a nice succinct one pager that tells you all about that topic of weight limits for using the lower anchor attachments. And if you were a tech, say 10 years ago, eight years ago, this was a huge topic, right? Before, uh, before NHTSA added the requirement to have the labels on car seats, really took us a while to wrap our brain around this whole topic of these lower anchor attachment limits. So uh, I can guarantee you back in those days, the latch manual had several pages on this topic and it was much more elaborate and explanatory. Now that we have seven years and plus in our rear view mirror on this topic, uh, we don't have to worry quite so much about understanding it. In fact, we mainly just have to think about the car seats that were pre-2014, the ones that were made in this period of time when the labeling um, details were slightly different. And then, of course, the more and more and more every day that goes by, we have more of these car seats made since 2015. And so this just is going to lay it out in a nice format. Two years later from now, I will have to re re assess whether even this section is still necessary as these car seats start to expire. But um, throughout the, the latch manual, there are topics such as this where I need to make sure that it's timely and written uh, for today's needs. 
And then there are also just things that change in the field. And so we're constantly keeping track of things that, that are, need to be updated. And for one of those is the inflatable seatbelt section. And this is another one of those that's kind of an extra in a way, but I, I like to include information both in Appendix A on the policies about inflatable seatbelts, as well as this part in chapter three that tells you the story of inflatable seatbelts. Just because if you have an inflatable seatbelt, that's going to be one reason why you're going to be more motivated possibly to use the latch system instead. So we want techs to know about this topic. You'll find this basic information in chapter three on page 28. And I had to update it this year because while we know that Ford introduced these inflatable seatbelts in the 2011 model year, uh, starting in uh, 20, the 2020 model year was the last year they were offered. No longer are those going to be uh, an optional part uh, feature for the Ford and Lincoln vehicles. And so now that kind of closes the book on the inflatable seatbelt era, at least for now. Of course, they can always come back. But for now, we had to update this to say this is how this was. Of course, we're going to see these cars, right? for a long, long time. And really uh, having this be something that is ended in a way makes it all the more important that you have this resource to go to and learn about them because it's gonna be something that comes up, but it's something from the past. And so uh, this all needed to be updated to be reflective of the fact that it's now no longer offered. And naturally, while I already mentioned I want to keep the layout the way it is so we can find things, there's going to be new topics that we want to add because this is always evolving and changing. And what I hear you need to know about is constantly being uh, updated. And so I, I do want to add new topics when they come up. Um, and so uh, one of the things that happened uh, Last year, I got a phone call from a very experienced technician and said, where does it say in the latch manual that you need to examine the lower anchors after a crash? And I said, well, the, the vehicle manufacturers sometimes mention that in their sections. Uh, and he said, yeah, I know that. I, I know all about what you should do, but I want to know where it says it because I want to be able to point to it in the manual in writing for the person who needs to know that, the, the caregiver who needs to know or a tech who's learning. And so that was kind of an aha moment for me in a way because it made me realize you know, that's an important thing to be able to do with the manual is have a place where you can point to and say, yes, uh, things do need to be examined after a crash. And this tells you where to go and what to do and how to think about that. And of course, after the year we just had, I, I had to put in a section that reminds people about cleaning of latch parts, because just like all the rest of the car seat, you know, there are metal parts, there are webbing parts that need to maintain their strength. And so this is really where you want to remember to always be checking with the manufacturer of the car seat to find out what their policies are because those are changing. Disinfectants generally are discouraged, but there are some exceptions. Definitely check with their websites to see if they've updated and especially through FAQs to see how to clean parts. And I do see in the questions before we move on from these chapter updates, uh, a good question about Mercedes inflatable seatbelts. Mercedes does have inflatable seatbelts as well. And in general, in our policies, uh, we try to make it clear that the inflatable seatbelt policies of the manufacturers that I'm gonna show you in Appendix A, those are for Ford Lincoln inflatable seatbelts. The Mercedes inflatable seatbelt, if you read the Mercedes manual, they say not to use it with any other manufacturers other uh, car seats other than their own. And if you go in the latch manual, you, you might not have noticed this, but in Appendix A, Mercedes actually has its own car seats. They have their own entry. And so you really are only supposed to use those with Mercedes car seats according to Mercedes. And so they are different kinds of uh, inflatable seat belts. They are in, entirely designed differently than the Ford ones are. And so you would not apply the inflatable seat belt policies of other, um, of the, for of the manufacturers of car seats that apply to Ford and Lincoln to those Mercedes vehicles. Okay, now I mentioned earlier that there are a couple chapters that have information directly from the car seat man or vehicle manufacturers, and those are going to be chapters six and seven. I'm only going to really focus on chapter six today. But I do want to note that chapter seven is about rear facing tethering and it's going to include information from those car seat manufacturers that do allow it with some details for what is allowed and not. And so we all know that as we come out of certification training, 
that is kind of a, you know, it's not a mainstream topic that gets a lot of attention, but it is something that technicians need to know about. So chapter seven is a terrific place to turn to, to just get the basics about, um, about the use of tethering in a rear facing mode. But I want to focus on chapter six today uh, about retrofitting tether anchors in vehicles. That is a place where you're going to find information from the vehicle manufacturers about the, the anchor um, tether anchor parts availability, their part numbers, as well as whether they still have them in stock, um, whether they have free installation programs available, weight limits, and things like that. I want to make note of the fact that each of the pages in the chapter six supplement that has those manufacturer specific information from all these manufacturers in the table of contents, those pages have this gray bar across the top. So when you look at the top of your latch manual, you'll notice a gray section and that can help you turn to those important pages that you wanna note uh, for that part. Um, prior to the supplement, by the way, are four pages that tells you the story of retrofitting tether anchors in general. So that's uh, also good information. But I wanna talk a little more about what we got for the 2021 manual when we, inter when we uh, got updates from each of the manufacturers. And like I noted, uh, we, we wanna get the part number that is gonna match up to the exact vehicle. And these are pre-latch uh, era vehicles. So these are vehicles from prior to 2000. Uh, mostly 89 to, to, to 2000 vehicles. And this is a topic, yeah, those are older cars, you bet. Um, but this topic is super important and I really um, like to emphasize it because, well, yeah, those are older cars, they are still in use. And we all know that those older vehicles may not have all the safety bells and whistles, but if there's a way we can add one little part to make those vehicles a lot more safe for children, then I really urge technicians to take this extra effort to kind of guide families toward that conclusion because it is really, really worthwhile to do. One of the things I wanna point out though is that the, the news this time wasn't great. We have a lot of manufacturers, actually I'm gonna to go to this slide um, and just ignore the orange, but look at the fact that it says parts availability for Mercedes. Um, they are no longer available for Mercedes parts. So if you look in the 2019 latch manual in this supplement, you'd find a table that lists all the different uh, model numbers. And in fact, um, this time they said, came back and said, you know what, all those parts have been used up, meaning they had a stock of parts back from the 90s and over time, owners of these vehicles have used them and they just aren't stocking them anymore. They don't restock them once they run out. And so while I, I we're seeing this, I know you're seeing this out there where they're happening that they have less and less stock on hand. Uh, I do pull that out of the latch manual so you don't send people on a wild goose chase looking for a part that no longer is available. At the same time though, please be aware there are many, many other uh, entries that do have a table with a lot of parts. So the parts are still available for some. So don't give up on that. Uh, although and there is still some other um, not such great news. And that is that the there while there used to be four free installation programs, General Motors, Ford, FCA, and then Toyota and Lexus, now um, General Motors has said they are discontinuing that program. So that's a kind of a sign of the times too, which isn't to say you can't retrofit these vehicles with these parts if you were to have them. You just, um, it, with General Motors, they won't install them for free. You might have to pay someone or do it yourself. And that leads us to wonder then about generic tether anchor kits. And I know this might be a head scratcher for some people. You may not have actually heard of these before, but in fact, back in the day, um, it used to be that you, you know, you could get a part from the vehicle manufacturer, but the car seat manufacturers would also make tether anchor retrofit kits. And so some of the manufacturers do allow, you can see this example here with Mercury, where they will say it's preferred to use their part, but if we've run out or you can't get it, a generic tether anchor kit is allowed if, you, if these parts aren't available. So, um, and there, you know, honestly, if you look through this supplement, you'll see there actually are some cars where that is actually what they say to do to retrofit is to get a generic kit. 
So you want to find out if it's okay with the vehicle manufacturer. And this is just an example of a kit that is from one of the, of the car seat manufacturers. And I want to warn you, it looks a little bit like parts you could get at a hardware store. And so I have to say, just because it looks like that doesn't mean it's okay to the, go to the hardware store and just get whatever looks like that, because you really do need to know it's the right thing, the right strength. And um, so it should really be only ones that come from a, a genuine uh, valid parts maker, like a, like a car seat or car manufacturer. And so, um, Unfortunately, the news on this isn't great either because as of the 2021 latch manual, the last car seat manufacturer, which is ETAC, that as of the 2019 was offering a generic kit, they discontinued their kit. So whereas back uh, 20 years ago, some of the mainstream car seat makers were offering generic kits, many of them did, over the years, Several of those have discontinued offering those until finally now there really are no generic kits being offered directly from any of the car seat makers. Uh, and I should clarify, there are some special needs car seat makers that will sell a tether anchor kit, but they are to be used with only their brand of car seat. And so what we're wanting to know is, well, what about a generic kit that can be used in any vehicle with an, uh, that where it's allowed and used with any car seat. And right now you can't get one of those directly from a manufacturer. Um, so that that is a concern. And it's especially of a concern because as I just noted, that kit that I just showed you looks a little bit like something I could put together at a hardware store, but I should not do that. And why that's a worry is that uh, people do do that. You can find DIY guys out there or DIY guys out there with that kind of thing going on. And there's also people selling kits like this. So watch out for fake latch as well. This is really very scary. It's easy to Google and find under retrofit latch. And the idea being that this is something that slides through the bite of the seat and that these two metal plates uh, uh, butt up here on the seat back, this is the back of the captain's chair, and then by this sticking out of the bite, they create lower anchors, and then this becomes the tether anchor. And so the problem we have is that vehicle manufacturers, they would say, oh dear, no, this isn't, you know, this would mean that the bottom of the seat would be taking all the load, and that is not how we want to reinforce it. Uh, that's not how we've anticipated the loads to be on this seat. And you can see it's not even installed anyway, not that you'd want to, right? But it's not something that is going to be stable. And it's really kind of scary to me because I know that if someone did slip this through a, a seat bite and install a car seat tightly with the tether attached, you probably would if you just do a typical test side to side, find that it would fit and feel tight. But the, the problem is in an actual crash, it would not hold. So please be on the lookout for this. What you really wanna do is make sure you get it from a reliable source. And as I've just explained, those are getting to be fewer and fewer and fewer. But um, so we added, another thing I added to the latch manual this time was at the in this table of contents for the supplement, down here in the corner, you'll find a new section that's about beware of non-manufacturer retrofit parts. Uh, it's going to discuss a lot of what I just said to you, but also knowing that there are some third-party vendors and like eBay and that kind of thing where you could get a kit in a in a you know in a bag that with the part number and everything that's still floating around out there. And if you were to actually come across something like that. We want you to know how to determine if that is actually indeed a legitimate part. And so I just wanted you to know at saferidenews.com under latch and then retrofit anchor, retrofit guide, tether anchor retrofit guide, there's actually a do-it-yourself guide as well as a table that lists the full inventory of all the different retrofit part numbers. So including the ones we've removed from the latch manual, because this will give you a place to go to double check if this is actually the right part for that vehicle. So we didn't want that, we didn't want that information in the latch manual where you're going to send a family off to go get something. But at the same time, we recognize there was a reason why you might want to someday go look for that. And so we posted that at Safe Ride News for you. Okay, so moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about the appendices, starting with Appendix A and just that basic question. I've got the manual, do I really need to check the latch manual too? So, you know, I'm going to say, yes, I really think you should. There's actually a lot of good information in there that is going to supplement what's in the manual or clarify or add to it. 
Uh, and so I'm going to draw your attention to page A4, which is just a page right before Appendix A entries for each of the manufacturers. And it has some good stuff here about how we get the information. It has some stuff about the abbreviations and some givens. But we're going to talk a little more about these, uh, the layout and content of the entries, just so you have a, an idea of this. Um, so for each of the entries, uh, they're going to be alphabetized and each manufacturer gets what we call an entry. And so in their entry, we're going to start with information that's going to be applicable to all the different products that this particular manufacturer makes. And then we're going to go through each of the types of, of, of car seats. So we're going to have the rear facing only, and we're going to go to convertible and combination and booster, you know. And then under each one of those, it'll always start with the lower anchor, attach, anchor attachments, and then it'll go to the tether information. And so you're just going to have that um, kind of regular flow. So anytime you go to the entry, you look for the type of the seat that it is. And if, say, it's a convertible seat, you're going to look under convertible. You're going to read about it there. But don't forget to go back to the very beginning of the entry and look at that information that applies to all so that you get the full picture. But then after all of those are done, there's also these extras, I think of them, the extra sections about information that is um, going to supplement all of that. And frequently, this is stuff that might not be in their owner's manual or may not be in their regular manual. So as you can see, there's going to be any recalls on latch uh, on unexpired seats. We're going to ask them about what to do with unused seat belts to prevent them from getting around a child's neck or we call that entanglement. Uh, we're going to ask about Canada specific details and school bus usage details that might be different than what's in the manual. So as you're reading through what's in their entry, figure everything there applies if you're in Canada or if you're in a school bus, except for these uh, things that are noted here. And as I mentioned, we have the inflatable seatbelt policy for Ford and Lincoln inflatable seatbelts. And then finally, we like to include a QR code because I think they're so cool if we're actually checking the latch manual but we want a quick way to get to instructions or maybe even a video of how to um, if they have that available and have a QR code for it I like to include it so we can get right there with our smartphone scanner and just check that out. So let's just take a quick look at um, Combi for an is just one example um, to show these kind of extras. We see we're ending with tethers of the car seat parts. And you can see actually there's a bunch of cool stuff that you might not get in an owner's manual there. But then we come down and we see that Combi does have some differences in using a school bus on a school bus. And as far as Canada goes, they don't have differences because you can't use this, any combi seats in Canada. They are not sold or distributed there. So that's going to be noted here. If you don't see that, that just means that just use it the same way in Canada. But we wanted to say, um, spell out that if it's not to be used in Canada, it's, it's stated here. Um, they do have a latch-related recall on a Kokoro, but you can see the years are pretty long ago. So we'll have to reassess that for the next latch manual to see if all of these have now expired because we don't want to, you know, recommend or um, imply that you could keep using a, an, uh, an expired seat. Uh, the inflatable seatbelt policy is here and yay, they do have a QR code. Notice they don't have an entanglement bullet noted, um, but that just it means that they didn't um, didn't give us, we asked for any, any information, they didn't provide us any suggestions, but you can always check with the vehicle manufacturers um, in their entry because we ask them that same question and we have that noted in their bullets. And going to the next, just in the book, going to the next one is Cybex. You know, I could flip through whatever, but just as another example, uh, you don't see Canada or school bus bullets here. And that just means that whatever it says in here, do it exactly the same in those settings. Uh, and they're, they've had recalls in the past for Cybex boosters, but those have all expired. So we removed those and they're not there anymore. And there's again, no entanglement, but we do have the inflatable seatbelt policy and you can find that handy QR code. Another thing to notice after all of those sections uh, is that we are gonna list the weights of the car seats themselves. And so this is just the example from Graco and we all know Graco, huge company, lots and lots of models. But note that this just includes the models that are convertibles, all-in-ones or combination seats. So these are your bigger car seats. Uh, your rear-facing only seats aren't listed here because we don't really need to know the weights of those 
for figuring out latch use because none of those seats are so heavy that when you add it to the upper harness limit, it exceeds the 65 pounds that we're working with when, we, when we're looking at that. And so we don't list those. And notice we also don't use uh, list the booster seats because when it comes to booster seats, lower anchor attachment weight limits never matter for a booster because it's the seat belt that's restraining the child, not, not the booster itself. And so this is going to be a useful place for you to find those weights rather than say weighing the seat yourself or finding something on a website. This is a, a good place for where the manufacturer is given this information for CPSTs for this exact purpose. And I, I have this question come up at the time I was putting this together, and I just had to include a little, little side story. I got a text that said, I'm helping a family with sons who are 8 and 10 that ride in a Diono 3QX, each, each in one of those, and an infant in a Nuna Pippa. And I'm looking at the manual. I don't see if I can use latch to stabilize the Dionos in booster mode. So I had just at the time this was asked to finish the latch manual. So I was like, oh, I think I know this, but I'm going to go look it up. And as I was doing so, she texted back and said, oh, never mind. I just found it. it says not to. And so oh, that's going to not make it easy to keep it stable. So the, if you're not familiar, this is the, the 3QX is one of the newer Radian models. That's the cover. And so I asked her, well, where did you find that information? She said, oh, it's on page 23 of the manual. So because I was like, oh, I'm going to need to make a change if that's true. So um, I, I looked at that page and I saw this down here at the bottom. And by the way, when you see latch slash UAS, that just means um, that this seat has been dual certified for use in the US and Canada. You can kind of see up here, UAS is what they call it in Canada. Um, and it says, do not install using both latch connectors and the vehicle seatbelt at the same time. And so I said, oh, no, 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 that just is meaning uh, don't, don't install it in harness mode that way. And she says, no, no, that's not what I meant. I meant this warning. I meant, don't, it says, don't use it for forward facing when restraining a child over 40 pounds. And these children are over 40 pounds. Oh, okay. Well, that's like I just said, those limits don't apply in booster mode. This doesn't really say it there, but it's telling you don't install in harness mode over 40 pounds, use a seatbelt for that instead. And she said, oh, okay, all right, fine. But then that made me wonder, this is in the latch section. So I thought, well, what does it say in the booster section? Maybe it's clarified there. And, and by the way, I don't want, I, I'm not saying this is anything about these Diono instructions in particular. I'm using this as an example because it really happened. And also because it's, it's just really very easy to become confused, as you can see. So when I go to this page, this page 58 and 59, that's all that this manual has for this three-in-one seat on booster use. So it's really succinct and they really do strive to make it simple and, 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 straightforward. But if you look at this one, you do see this warning, use only the vehicle lap shoulder belt system when restraining the child in this booster seat. And that could be confused as well. That didn't really clear things up for me. But really what that is trying to say is it goes with this next statement, which is don't use a lap belt. It shouldn't be a lap only belt. It should be a lap shoulder belt. So again, while this could be misread to imply that it shouldn't be used in booster mode, uh, it is not the intention of that particular statement. So this is where it's really, I, I really like to point out that the latch manual can give you a place where you can go get that clarification and have it in the same place every time. So if I go to Diono and I look for boosters and I, the first statement is going to be whether or not we can use it in booster mode. And in this case, you can read this. It says not only is it allowed, it's optional, yeah, but it's recommended to use the lower anchor attachment and or the tether as long as long as that doesn't interfere with the proper belt fit on the child uh, and of course store the parts when they're not in use. And so just be aware that if you find a confusing statement like that, frequently there's going to be some guidance in the latch manual that can help solve the problem. Okay, so we have a few minutes left and I want to leave some time to talk about Appendix B and C. So we're going to shift over to Appendix B and talk about a little bit about the bullets is where I'm going to focus. Um, and if you've heard me speak before, I have done a whole presentation just going over all these bullets. So um, just be aware what a, a bullet is. It's that very first part that you can think of as an extension of the vehicle model's notes. So anything you read in the notes is good, but you want to make sure you go back to the bullets because it's going to give you a ton more information. 
but it really would be uh, obviously way too wordy to include that in every single note. And so we have to put it in to uh, a bullet form so you can apply it to all. Um, and importantly, these are gonna be some topics that you might not get in the owner's manual, or they're gonna be topics that might be in current manuals, but not in past ones. And so this gives the manufacturer an, a way to tell us about information that is um, gonna be useful for any of their vehicles. And so always up here in the top left is where you have your weight limit information, always in the top uh, center, you're gonna have your center borrowing, and then you have a lot of other goodies I won't get into today. But a couple things I do wanna point out that are especially notable in the new one, and that is um, with the latch with booster seats. You can see Nissan says it's okay to use latch with the booster seat. Of course it has to be okay with the car seat manufacturer, and that has to be if proper belt fit is maintained on the child, and that's always a given, right? Um, most of the vehicle manufacturers have said over the years that you can, but there have been, as you know, might know, about a half a dozen that have said, no, you can't use it with, um, a, with a, a booster seat with latch in our vehicles. And so for this one, in those questions we asked at the beginning, we said, look, can you tell us a little bit more about why that is? Why, if the car seat manufacturer allows it, why are you saying we can't do it? And definitely we understand, of course, that if it impairs belt fit, then it shouldn't be done. You shouldn't shift the seat to make it work with latch to, and then at the expense of the seat belt aligning on the body, right? But given that it do, that doesn't happen, can you say a little bit more? And you know, to our um, delight, we were to found that rather than tell us the reasons, I think each of the manufacturers, and these were different separate manufacturers, but they all came back to us and said, you know, with further thought, they changed their policy and said, yes, you may attach a booster seat to the lower anchors and or the tether anchor, as long as it's okay with the car seat manufacturer and proper belt fit is maintained. So you really do still have to go back, of course, and confirm that it's okay with a car seat maker, especially for your all-in-ones and combination seats in booster mode, because you know those weren't necessarily, those are equipped with latch, but that's not necessarily for booster mode. So you gotta double check that and make sure it's okay. That's gonna be stated in appendix A clearly for you each time. But I can tell you now that all of the vehicle manufacturers are saying it's okay to use with a booster. So that's great. And then there are, uh, also, there's a new, sorry, slow, there we go. Uh, another the, uh, bullet that we added this time is on split seat backs because we wanted to specify for some of those car brands that have cars like SUVs and, and some, um, some vans with bench seats where you could maybe have latch that crosses between seats that slide or seat backs that fold. It's just a reminder that with these split seat backs that the seat has to be uniform in depth and angle when you're using latch. And then also on the center position topic, um, there has been some movement on that, which is great. Back in the lavender latch manual, Nissan would have said, no, you can't borrow the inner bars of the standard outboard latch positions to install in the center. And fortunately for the 2021, they say, don't do it unless a note says that you may. So they do have some newer models that, that where that is allowed. So uh, that's nice to see some more opportunities to be able to use latch in center positions. And just to make sure I'm clear on that, that's that whole topic where um, we have clearly here four latch bars. They're under covers, but you can see where the latch bars would be. And those are intended with the proper standard spacing to be used in the two outboard spots. But if we wanted to use it in the center, that would be wider than 11 inches apart. And so the thing we have to note is with those four bars that the manufacturers are testing them uh, and they're, they're, they're required testing that's by the, the standard is to pull straight outward. And when the manufacturers install these um, bars, these are working as a team, the two bars together and pulling outward. It's a different story when you take the bars that weren't intended to work as a team and you pull on them at a different angle. So we really got to be sure before we, even if we feel like it gets super tight, we got to be sure that both the car manufacturer and the car seat manufacturer say it's okay to do that because they've tested it and they're confident that it can be done safely. And so that leads me to uh, table C1 of Appendix C. Now, Appendix C, remember, is that one that talks all about center use. And there's more to that 
It's a short little appendix, but uh, it has parts that talk about standard center use and some general information. But I want to just focus today on this table C1, which is a cross-reference table that's going to list for you all the different brands and cars uh, that have uh, and their and their model years that allow the use of center borrowing and cross-referenced against the vehicle or the car seat manufacturers that also allow it. And so each of these has um, their, what they say state is the allowed width. Some of them, it just has to be 11 inches at least and others say up to a certain number of inches. And so here we list the space between the different models. And so we get our yes and no answers when we cross reference. So a couple important things to note, if you don't see a car seat brand listed across the top, then it goes into this category or a car brand listed in the the right hand column, then of course that's any not listed. And in that case, the answer is always no. If they're not listed, then that means they're not, then it's not allowed. The other thing is there are some um, qualifying information under these footnotes that go down here. So be sure you read those. Again, this is a quick reference list that cross references and we hope it's helpful for you, but the but the source information itself can be found in the Appendix A and Appendix B entries. So you're perfectly fine to just go there to get the information, but it is kind of put into one table for quick access right here in uh, Table C1. Okay, so that kind of wraps up our wandering through the latch manual. I do want to note some things on our website that can help support you, including the fact that, you know, time marches on after we get this book printed up. And so we do have latch manual updates that are posted. And if you want to be notified by email when we add a latch manual update, please go to the footer on our saferidenews.com homepage. You'll find a place where you can sign up to get those uh, notifications by email. We also have lots of articles and other support on the website, as well as the Latch Gallery, which is a place for us to get to put things that we can't fit in the Latch Manual, but and we can put in color pictures. And this is the kind of stuff where it's like, boy, you've got to see this to believe it, right? So it will say in the Latch Manual under that model vehicle notes, see the Latch Gallery if you want to see more. And that is where you're going to find it on our website under Latch. You find the Latch Gallery. Also, there's a latch manual quiz uh, that's available. That's going to be an open book quiz, of course, you can take online. If you score a passing score, you can earn a CEU. And even if you don't need a CEU, I write that quiz to help, hopefully help you learn more about how to find things. So it's like a little exercise that you can use to find things in the latch manual. So you'll also find that at saferidenews.com. So we have so much more there. I've been working a lot actually over the last year, adding things to the resources tab. So I do encourage you to go check under that resources tab and find all the free stuff that you can find at saferidenews.com. And do get in touch with us if you come across things that you think could be improvements to the latch manual. That's how we make this community resource that much better the next time around. And so Stephanie, um, I have not been trying to watch all the questions. Do you have any questions that hey, I do? Please. Yep, there, there are a couple of questions. We have a couple minutes to be able to ask some questions. One of the top questions that I've seen a couple of times, are there plans on a virtual app for the Latch Manual? Okay, so, and, and I see that Brittany says, you're probably tired of this. It's like, I'm not tired of it. I definitely understand that this is an important question. Um, and so uh, we, I can tell you, we are working on it. It probably won't be an app. It'll be some way to access electronically that you will be, it has to be responsive and, and searchable. And we're really working. We've actually done some work on, on testing some, some software out. Um, software is in development that will be more useful. It's a little different than a regular ebook, you know, when you have to do a reference resource of this type. So um, we're working on that and we are hopeful to get something for you for this edition of the latch manual, but I can't make any promises at this time as to when that would be. Any right. others? Yeah, um, John asked that he's been getting a lot of parents wanting to use a latch and a seatbelt. What is the reason not to use both when the manual says do not use both? 
That's a good question. And, you know, I see that I do a lot of uh, virtual checks for the NUNA, NUNA seats and they say in their manual, it's okay to do it. And so almost every time the, the parent has done both together. And so, you know, there are times where they're going to get mixed messages and they frequently don't realize that the vehicle manufacturer may say not to, or they may say it's okay. Um, that's actually a topic, another topic that's in chapter three. We do say in chapter three, which vehicle manufacturers do allow it. So you can go check there. But, um, but as far as the rationale, uh, I'm going to start with just the basics. Whatever the manufacturer says goes, right? So they say not to, so we shouldn't. But beyond that, um, I will note, you, many people in the field might not remember, but right after Latch came out, there was something called the Latch Working Group that formed, that was an indus voluntary industry group that was formed from a bunch of manufacturers of vehicles to study certain of the topics that were uh, clearly going to be challenging for this new latch era. So one of those topics was whether they should use, um, whether both could be used together. And while that uh, that latch working group unfortunately had to disband when the um, auto industry had their troubles in 2008, they did complete study of that one topic and they came back with uh, reasons why uh, th they were going to recommend against using both. And those had to do with alignment and getting in the way of the buckles and the latch in the way with each other and various things like that. I do discuss this in the latch manual chapters. So if you if you look up the latch working group, um, I believe it's in chapter three, but it might be chapter two. Um, and so it discusses that a little bit more. But that was where the industry kind of left it as our best, their best practice, right? Um, will this topic ever come up again or be re readdressed? That I don't know for sure, but, uh, you know, because it's not, it, it could, but at this point, that is what best practice is. Great. Well, we are just about out of time here. And so, um, as you can see on this slide, Denise's information is there. If we didn't get to your question, please reach back out to her. And before we go and have our last minute reminders, Denise, is there anything else that you would like to add? Um. No, I, well, mainly just uh, thank everybody for all of your hard work throughout this pandemic. This has been a challenging time, but also really exhilarating to see how much everyone has done to, to take our work and continue to reach families. So I, I really think the Latch Manual has come through in many ways for me, certainly in helping me with uh, helping families virtually. My very first check I did virtually, I, I found in my latch manual, there was a latch recall uh, in the vehicle <laughs> when using that type of seat with a rigid latch. It was like, wow, okay, I, I this is reminding myself that this needs to be used in, in those settings as well. And so uh, I, I really thank you all for uh, continuing your work and I hope that these resources will help you in that. With that, again, thank you, Denise, for your time today. And thank you to everyone out there that joined in with us and was there to learn. And we appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great and safe day.